Amen. So we'll start with a review. We construct we constructed um, the light of the 144,000. in the line of the priests. We placed ourselves here between Raphia and Panium 2019 and 2021 between the increase of knowledge and the formalization of the early reign for the 144,000. The increase of knowledge has come last year. The increase of knowledge of the Sunday law. Our preparation for the Sunday law. It started in February in Brazil. And it didn't start by taking us to the Millerite history of slavery. It started by taking us to 1888. And it essentially said, you Adventists love 1888 so much but we do not understand the external. We don't understand the external history fight of A.T. Jones. What he and others were standing for, were fighting against. And we made the statement If we were to face a similar fight today about church and state, Adventism is on the wrong side. And the litmus test was 2015 gay marriage. So we started in 2019 in, with the 1888 history. God entered that entering wedge of you don't understand 1888 itself. He's saying to his people, you don't understand how church and state works. And then by August, he's shown us we'd forgotten Millerite history. When there was a different sin in the cup of America. And when Ellen White says, in about 1868, Christ should have come back. We can easily demonstrate the sin that overthrew America in that history was not Sunday.
The Sabbath Sunday issue was there. Because an alpha history is always the reintroduction of the Sabbath. And God's people would have ended up persecuted for that. But that does not make it the sin that filled the cup. We spoke yesterday about how a waymark is a period of time. We have three histories for modern Israel. Miller Wright, 1888. Us. He started by showing us 1888. In February. Miller Wright in August. And the review of these two histories changed our understanding of the Sunday law in our history. It was a period of time, their increase of knowledge, just as ours was this year. Because a waymark is a story. So we stand in the swelling of the understanding of the Sunday law. Heading towards the formalisation. We also stand on the line of the priests. Quite at the same place as a fractal. Heading towards the formalisation. And we know that this is the subject of marriage and equality. We discussed 1798. I'm going to erase these two lines now for space, if you don't mind. We discussed 1798 as the time of the end. And we decided to view it the way Ellen White does. That we are in the time of the end at each point from 1798. So in 1910, if Ellen White wants to say she's in the time of the end, that's accurate. And everything that occurred since 1798 is in the time of the end.
and God has given us different models to help break down this time period. To make sense of what is happening externally. He's lifting the curtain on the great controversy. So we can see the players behind it. How this conflict has been fought in the time of the end. Now, if people want to write in the chat, the three structures I mentioned yesterday that he's given us. Three different structures with three different themes to make three different points or three different overlaying applications. If you can think of any other structures, please also write in the chat. If there's another structure we take to the time of the end. So the three I mentioned yesterday The first one is the structure of modern Israel. Does everyone remember that? Sister Raquel is saying Egypt, Babylon, Rome. That's the ancient Israel structure that we can see as an evidence for modern Israel. I'm looking particularly for the three structures in the time of the end. What is modern Israel's three histories? Millerite, eighteen eighty eight, hundred and forty four thousand. And as people have recognised, failure, failure, success. What's the second structure we looked at? The counterfeit. What's the theme of modern Israel? Who, who's the subject matter? God's people. I'm just going to call it Adventism. Who's the subject for the counterfeit?
paper see. Now if I'm not going to say anything more than that, it's just a comment some people may object to. If Christ had have returned in 1863, the papacy would never have gotten its boots on. Would have been honoured by Protestantism. But the papacy was not strong. That didn't happen. So in 1899, the papacy is able to ready itself. How many histories? Three. What are they? Has to be three, it's a counterfeit. Someone suggests the three world wars. Close. There's World War One, World War Two, World War Three. What's the alpha history of the counterfeit? So, Sister Tiffany says Fatima. So that's going to 1917. Sister Rose, Brother Marshall. Alpha history is 1899 to 1945. I agree. And that encapsulates both world wars. So World War I and World War II are both part of the first history. Are we okay with that? It's not World War One, World War Two, World War Three. It's World War One, World War Two, First, Second Angels Messages. World War Three. Eighteen ninety nine to nineteen forty five. The work of Miller and Snow, first and second angels messages. Seventeen ninety eight to eighteen forty four. Forty six years. 1899 to 1945. The 46 years of the Alpha history counterfeited. Resurrected by the messages of Miller and Snow. Disappointment, failure, scattered. 
resurrected by World War I, World War II. Disappointed, scattered. 46 years, 46 years. So what's their second history of failure? Sister Raquel says, Pope John Paul II. The history of 1989. Takedown of the Soviet Union. The angry Pope did not get what he wanted. When does their history of success start? Two thousand and one. Failure, failure, success. Pope Pius the twelfth. John Paul two. Benedict and Francis. Counterfeit getting closer. The third model yesterday, what was that? In God we trust. The subject of this camp meeting. What's the theme of this structure? We have Adventism, Papacy and Papacy's Church and State. This is Protestantism. And Brother Mikhail's already getting it. He said three histories. Both the study of last year and this document say there are three movements to make America a Christian nation in Millerite history they didn't really need to do this just after the second great awakening it practically was But when that history is a failure, Protestantism mobilises in three histories. And what are these histories? Christian Amendment Movement. I'll say vaguely is 1863 to 1900. Judo Christian nationalism. I'll put vaguely as the 1950s, but it started in the 40s. And the new Christian right. which we know will take us from 1979 
at least to the Sunday law. And like the two histories above them, two structures, this was failure for them. What Ellen White was framing as would be a success. When she says the movements now in progress will imminently introduce the Sunday law. Just as she said, back here, Christ will return in your lifetime. She frames this as if they were a history of success. She has to. Then in this history, all through the great controversy, she frames that as a history of success. She has to. But they failed. Jones failed, Wagner failed. So we have a history of failure, a history of failure and a history of success. So if people understand other structures to break down the time of the end history, I'm not saying they don't exist, please mention them. As you might think of them. I don't think the 10 year history could be used as a structure to, to break it down this way. Everything people are mentioning, I would suggest give us more information on these three structures. Ancient Israel is going to give us an explanation of this structure. The question was, do we have more than these three structures to break down the time of the end? And I'm suggesting that the ones so far mentioned give more detail onto these. There might be something to the three woes. So that's a good point. I'm suggesting that these three are the key structures God has given us to break down Adventism, the papacy and Protestantism. And however much they differ in time in the histories of failure, Now they all run together because we're heading to a point of conflict at the Sunday Law. So all three groups are mobilised. Now when I started a series in May, I was determined that the 
Subject of study needed to be Millerite history. And I found it personally frustrating when I kept getting distracted from that in what seemed to be this study of just the history of Protestantism. I couldn't verbalise it then. But God was moving us from this structure to this structure. I found that frustrating. So looking back, I fought him a little. Because I wanted to talk, to talk about this, not this. And I guess referencing Elder Parminder's presentation, it encourages me that when we get out of line, God kicks us back onto the path he wants us to take. even if we get frustrated with him. So we did lay out Millerite history at the Oceana um, camp meeting particularly. We did need to understand Millerite history, especially in the context of the election. But what we were particularly meant to be turning to was the history of Protestantism. So at this camp meeting, it's the third structure that we're revisiting. Which is why we have sent out this document as study material. Which, as you all know, covers the exact same three histories. From a, I would suggest, a very reliable source. Don't know if you've read the other material of Jared A. Goldstein. I haven't yet. But I'm particularly interested in his one on nationalism. We discussed yesterday the author. So time of the end history, three structures helping us break down failure, failure, success for Adventism, failure, failure, success of the papacy, failure, failure, success of Protestantism. Uh, someone has asked if I will, sh will share the documents. I can find and share them. That will be done. It's a good idea. After the camp meeting. Um, after the camp meeting, they'll put, be put out on the media broadcast. So 
so no one gets distracted from this one. But thank you to those who found the links. So that's helpful. So we're going to work through this document. The whole of it cannot be read. So a couple of disclaimers. When I read, I'm likely to be paraphrasing. if there are words that I think will be difficult for translation. The translators have the document, they can either use another word or go with a more direct translation. Some might, might be paraphrased. Some might be summarised. And we're going to have to skip large portions to, to get to the points. So I'm going to assume hope that people have been able to read it. And the parts I skip are not insignificant. So please don't ignore the parts that I skip. But we're limited on time. And then we will supplement as we go through from three sources. The second document It discusses the covenanters. The most relevant branch of Protestantism to this history. We're going to go into the covenanters and discuss their founder who was John Knox in Scotland. Then we'll also use A.T. Jones I forget our third third source Oh, the book, The Evangelicals, The Struggle to Shape America by Francis Fitzgerald. So I won't be quoting that book because that's difficult. But I'll make some blanket statements. And I'll try and say this was found in the book, if, I, if that's a reference. So if you turn to your document, how the Constitution became Christian. This document begins with an introduction. Then it is divided into three parts. The introduction, you can't read it. 
the fight to make the Constitution Christian, first history, Judo-Christian nationalism of the Eisenhower era, this history, the constitutional nationalism of the new Christian right, this history. And then a conclusion. So it has an introduction, three histories, and then a conclusion. So we're going to go through the introduction fairly quickly. If you've heard Elder Paminda talk about the principles of good writing, You say what you're going to say, you repeat it again, and then you repeat it again. He follows that exactly. So he says practically everything in the introduction. But I don't want to go into too much detail there because we're going to work th through each history in three parts. So even though there's so much in the introduction that is loaded, we'll keep moving. First page. He says, movements dedicated to make the United States a Christian nation have been a recurrent feature in American politics for more than 150 years. First sentence, sorry. Yes, page 259. Now in this history, they denounced the Constitution as a godless document unworthy of a Christian nation and fought to amend it. In contrast, our history, that came together in the 1970s, they hold up the Constitution as the highest expression of the nation's Christian identity. The purpose of this document is to discuss how it went from being hated to being lauded. Third paragraph. They'll understand the conflict over the Constitution by discussing these three movements. So he showed how these movements were different. Hate the Constitution, love the Constitution. 
Now he wishes to make the point that they're similar. They follow a similar pattern. So I hope you can see he's taken three histories He began by contrasting them. But now he's going to compare them. He's using the rules of parable teaching. And how they're similar, he's going to say that there's a dominant religious group They observe a perceived threat to their dominance. So they mobilize. They believe that their Christian devotion is part of America's essence. So any perceived threat to their Protestant faith they can interpret as a nationalistic attack on America's identity itself. And they have to preserve their identity by either ha amending the Constitution when they hated it or interpreting it their way when they love it. Last paragraph. Through this reoccurring pattern in which a threat to group status is understood in nationalist terms. So there's nationalism through this. Because of how they interpret national identity. So this reoccurring pattern is a dominant religious group seeing a group threat. They mobilize. They make demands based on the constitution. And then they begin to fight. I'm going to skip the first part of the introduction. We won't go into the final fine details of how they fight over the constitution. But we'll go to page 262. I just want to highlight a couple of points from each page. Their fight over the, the identity of the nation all centres on the constitution. So at page 262, that first paragraph, beginning as this article begins to show.
as this article begins to show the relationship between the constitution and national identity is quite different than conventional wisdom suggests. Rather than defining what it means to be American, the Constitution has been, become the battleground on which disputes over national identity are fought. So people look to the Constitution to define what it means to be American. But it's like people expect too much of it. Because as he says, a libertarian will read a libertarian constitution. A progressive will read a progressive constitution. And others find in the Constitution confirmation that the nation is defined by race, ethnicity and religion. Nativists read a nativist constitution while white supremacists read a white constitution. So it can depend what you want to see. And each group might have a point. So each group takes their different points and they fight over this battleground. Over their right to fight what America is in its essence. How readest thou? One of the issues is people expect too much. Because when white supremacists read a white constitution, they have a point. It's this nationalism, this idea of American exceptionalism. that lifts up this document well above the status it should have. And I've never heard anyone try and frame this better than Obama. When he des describes it as that star you'll follow. but he describes it as everything in motion. Not with the idea that Amy Coney Barrett has, that they have to interpret it as it was understood and meant in 1798. when it was written by white nationalists. And sexist nativists. So they're going back and saying, it's all important what we, it meant then. Obama is saying this is a flawed document and everything is in motion. Which means we need to reinterpret, amend anything necessary. But there
they're all fighting over the Constitution. Because Obama will look at it and pick out all the progressive parts. And see that as, as evidence that America must head in a progressive direction. It's the battleground. In the next three paragraphs, he's going to briefly summarize the three parts. that are each discussing these three histories. Part one looks at the 19th century movement to amend the constitution to proclaim national devotion to Jesus Christ. As this chapter will discuss, some evangelical Christians rejected the Constitution because they considered it a godless document that lacked any expression of religious devotion. This began during the Civil War and continued to the end of the century. They organised a national movement to make the Constitution Christian. Because their national identity was, they perceived, was threatened by other groups. And he lists four threats. Catholics, Jews, Seventh-day Adventists and religious freethinkers. We'll go further into that. Last sentence of that paragraph. The nation's Christian Protestant identity could be saved, the movement argued, if only the constitution could be made Christian. The subject of, this, of introducing a Sunday law was only a small part of that fight. One part, that was not the whole. The fight was to amend that constitution and make it reflect their religious identity. Then he goes to part two. Part two looks at Judeo-Christian nationalism, Judeo-Christian nationalism of the Eisenhower era. We might discuss this in a little more detail. As to why they start using Judeo-Christian rather than back here Christian. Because we mark this taking off in 1948. And the problem is they want to force America into their Protestant structure.
and they have to be very careful how they do that. because it's a few short years after 1945. And another church-state relationship just tried to do a similar thing. Nazi Germany had tried to force its identity on its population. And Hitler gave a bad name to this identity of Christian. So they have to step very carefully in the 1950s. To show they are against, uh, are against not just communism, but fascism. And they're going to soften what they're doing by identifying themselves with the persecuted Jews. Try and separate themselves from Hitler. But Sister Debbie made a point that was another issue. In 1798, Protestants are not talking about the need for a state of Israel. But they had developed that message. Their understanding of uh, the Battle of Armageddon, the need for Israel to be a nation, which occurred in 1948. Going back to that paragraph, beginning with little opposition, two-thirds through. They succeeded in some of what they requested. Both histories of, of failure had some, some small successes. They succeeded in adding the phrases under God to the Pledge of Allegiance and in God we trust to the national motto. But then they failed. The whole movement ground to a halt uh, with some key Supreme Court decisions in that history. Then as we'll discuss, so much happens in the 1960s. So much to perceive as a threat. Part 3 examines the constitutional vision of the new Christian right, the Christian conservative movement that coalesced in the late 1970s, led by televangelists Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson. Jerry Falwell, Pat Robinson. In 
he's going to again make the contrast. They are going to lift up the constitution. as a charter for a Christian nation. Compared to this group that condemned the constitution. On page 264, he's going to explain or compare these histories. The repeating pattern you can identify in each. What's the first step? They identify a group threat. There's a threat to their national identity. To their version of Protestant preeminence. Second, they structure this around a nationalistic framework. In that first threat, first step, I'm Jerry Falwell. I consider that what I am as an even white evangelical male is a prototype. Do we understand the concept of a prototype? It's that, it's that mould. Everything has to fit into that mould. You want to invent something. You create this structure, this thing, You create this pen, someone says a template, that's a good example. Now everything coming after this has to look like this. A first model of something. from which other forms are just copies. So Jerry Falwell would see himself as a prototype of what an American should be. That prototype is under threat. This isn't just a threat, a religious threat, this is a th an attack on America itself. So they're going to cast this around a nationalistic framework. And then they're going to try and preserve their status. Through demands based on the constitution. They'll look to that document to entrench their identity. He says, in each of these episodes, you see this same pattern. A 
the dominant group perceives a threat to their prototypical status? See that as a threat on the nation itself? and respond by demanding that the constitution reflect the group's identity. Whether that be through amending the constitution or interpreting the constitution. We'll stop now and then tomorrow we're going to begin part one. We're going to go into this history. And, and try and look into first history of failure in more detail. Scattering, scattering, gathering. I think I'm not being very good with my word choice. I would agree that's a theme. But I don't think it's a, a, a standalone structure. So you, you could take that theme and you could bring it to these structures. So it's probably my misuse of the word theme. We have three standalone structures. There may be more. But this is what we need for Adventism, the papacy, Protestantism. And then some of these other things are going to come along and they're going to help explain and break down those three structures. If that makes sense. We've discussed the import of these three structures. How each has three histories. We've began to go through this document. We've worked our way quickly through the introduction and we're ready to get, begin history number one. which we will do tomorrow. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the effort you've gone to to think that you see so much worth in your human family. that you've gone to all of this effort to help our feeble minds open that curtain and see the working of the great controversy. To help us understand the mobilization of each group today May we see the, how much of a message of God's love is in these prophetic studies.
prophecy not being separated from your love for us. But like a parent, it's your care for us. I pray, Lord, that we will dedicate ourselves to these studies with that mindset. May we love the revelation of you that you are giving us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.